So we're now beginning to get an idea of what you mean by ecopolis, which, which you put paint as the, the opposite of petropolis. It's a lovely idea. And um, amongst its features, you suggest is the concept that we should each only consume about 2,000 watts. Now, this, this is already in practice. Apparently, it's an idea that began in Switzerland. How popular is, is this idea already? Well, it hasn't been implemented yet in Switzerland. There's work going on in Zurich and in Basel and other Swiss cities to try and reduce the throughput of energy to something like that level, currently about six to five to 6,000 watts per person. Now, one thing we need to look at is if, if we look at the energy output that a human body is capable of, it's only about a thousand, uh, about 100 watts, but we are on a daily basis across Europe using about 6,000 watts in America, double that figure. So we have an enormous challenge to try and get uh, down to, uh, from in significant ways, from our current uh, 6,000 watts or so in Europe, elsewhere, as I said, in America, double that figure in Australia too, by the way. So certainly in Switzerland, there's now active initiatives in this direction where uh, it is shown that in the 1960s, uh, Swiss uh, citizens used about 2,000 uh, watts per person. So that means obviously energy efficiency in buildings, in transport systems, uh, reduced reliance on the motor car, and all the various measures that you know the environmental movement has been talking about for years. And it's certainly per perfectly feasible for us to do that. But then the, the critical question is, if we become more energy efficient in individual activities, are we going to then increase the range of activities that we are engaged in, consume more and more uh, other things so that we'll continue to ramp up our energy use uh, you know, in, in, in various other ways. So certainly the question of personal responsibility as well as policy measures in this uh, direction are critically important. When I say policy measures, it's actively encouraging people to consume less rather than simply replacing an energy consuming activity that has been reduced in impact by other consumption measures. So that is a critical issue and it also very much directs us in, in the direction of you know, really seriously thinking about the future and how we as individuals need to take ethical responsibility for the way we use energy. Of course the question then arises, can we replace the current input of fossil fuels into our urban systems with renewable energy. And there's certainly a lot of you know, examples now from around the world where this is beginning to happen. Cities like Copenhagen, or I, I worked in Australia and Adelaide where we are showing that uh, it's a really significant proportion of the energy now supplied in these places coming from wind power and from solar power. All this is great stuff, but it would be an illusion to think that we can do this from within the urban territory uh, cities are usually quite densely built up areas and so certainly to have enough surfaces for solar energy or to have enough places where we can have wind power within city uh, environments is very, very difficult indeed. So that's where we need to look back at how cities in the past were connected closely to the uh, en environment around cities, not only from the point of view of bring in energy resources, but also food resources. It is perfectly possible to reconnect much more closely to the local environment of cities rather than relying on global supplies as we currently do. And that's certainly part of the story of creating uh, regenerative cities, or as, as I use the term, ecopolis in this context. By the way, this term has been used quite a bit by other people as well, not just by myself. Sure. Um but you do have a, a vast amount of experience which you've distilled into this remarkably concise book. And um, I, I'm wondering uh, if there are any other things that you've left out of the book, for instance, perhaps some case studies from Africa or other developing countries, uh, which you might like to share with us. Well, I personally have worked um, in various cities, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, uh, I did a lot of work on London, kind of defining London's metabolism some years ago, simply quantifying the problems, the resource use problems of a huge urban system such as London, which I did about 20 years ago. And we came to the conclusion that London, uh, in terms of its ecological footprint, uh, which is derived in, in numerical terms from a quantitative analysis of its resource throughput, requires 
a surface area of roughly the size of the, all the productive land in England. And some more recent studies have, in fact, doubled this figure to up to 300 times London's surface area. So certainly, I've been involved in studies of this kind myself, and uh, I've worked in Adelaide, Australia, a lot, where we went, then took it a stage further and said, OK, we have a major problem with how cities can sustain themselves uh, with resources in, in, in a regenerative way. What can we do in practical terms to try and implement measures to kind of change the way these cities work? So 10 years ago, I was asked to be a thinker in residence in Adelaide to try and come up with ideas for how this city could be transformed in terms of its resource use. And I'm pleased to say 10 years later, really a major uh, transformation has been achieved through policy measures by the government of South Australia and the city government of Adelaide itself. I was also involved in uh, developing ideas for eco-cities in China, particularly the Dongtan Eco City Project, uh, on an island off Shanghai called Chongming Island. Unfortunately, that project hasn't impl been implemented so far, but it is certainly true that it has been very influential in planning policy terms throughout China, and we can look forward to much more sensitive and, I would say, regenerative urban development measures in uh, countries like China, where currently uh, urbanization is rampant and until recently has not been very concerned about the the implications for resource use and for pollution and all these uh, externalities uh, that uh, have uh, reared their ugly head. Uh, air pollution, for instance, in Chinese cities, as we know, is a huge problem, but the question of how uh, that air pollution trans translates to climate change is only now being considered and hopefully will be coming up at the COP20 and 21 conferences, climate change conferences of the UN uh, this, this year and next year. So there's certainly a lot of thinking going on about how an urbanizing world will become or could become compatible with the world's ecosystems. But so far, when it comes to actually impl Im implementing solutions, we are still very far off the mark at this moment in time. People yeah. are still wanting to build petropolis rather than ecopolis across the world. That's right. And of course, the will has to be there for, for a city to become a regenerative system. And uh, not just the will, but there has to be training, there has to be accountability. And this kind of, uh, if you like, structure inbuilt into society has to, is especially lacking in, in developing countries. So how can we yeah. overcome these challenges so that they, they don't, people there don't make the same mistakes as, as are being made in cities like Dubai and Saudi Arabia that you document in your book? But they seem, to, yeah. they seem to want to emulate, don't they? Well, certainly when you look at these Middle Eastern cities, and I've done quite a lot of work in, in recent years uh, in, in, in the Middle East, particularly in Saudi Arabia, I mean, we are staring at monstrous urban systems in the face there. It's just extraordinary mm. how, of course, countries that are so uh, you know rich in fossil fuels then build cities that are utterly dependent uh, on, on powering their cities in this way. But when it comes to, for instance, Saudi Arabia, it's a very interesting story. Uh, it is expected that under current trends, uh, this you know world's largest exporter of oil could require all the all the oil resources that are currently produced in Saudi Arabia for its own use. Already, it's about thirty percent of the oil produced in that country and are used within the country itself <laughs> for you know running uh, SUVs. You know, with the the price of petrol there is about. 12 uh, cents, you know, euro cents a, a litre. So you can imagine how people waste that uh, re uh, precious resource. I mean, it is not really regarded as a precious resource. It's simply pumped out of the ground at very low cost. But so beginning to realise, uh, you know, the, the leaders, the, the policymakers in that country are beginning to realise that this cannot continue. But now the quest is there to try and implement projects that show that one can run a city, a country with two or three large cities that are so totally dependent on fossil fuels in different ways. So there is now a certain amount of renewable energy development taking place there, but also in, in other parts of the Middle East. But it's all very much at the beginning. Mm. Abu Dhabi has taken these uh, uh, questions or these issues a little bit further by 
creating the Mazda City uh, Eco City project, but it is very rudimentary and it's only about five to ten percent of the original idea for creating this Eco City project has so far be, been implemented. Nevertheless, in Abu Dhabi, there's quite a substantial investment now taking place in renewable energy, and some of that is some of that money is actually coming all the way to Europe. Like for instance, the London Array, the large, the world's largest wind farm in the Thames Estuary, is part funded by Abu Dhabi. So there are interesting developments of this kind, but it's never enough. We are sort of gradually heading in a better direction, but it's all still too little, and if we are not careful, too late. So. Are you pessimistic or are you optimistic about the future? Do you, do you think we can turn this around? We need an enormous acceleration in the speed of change. And so far, I don't see that happening to anything like the degree that is necessary. It is certainly true that at the level of discussions about the future of cities, city organizations like ICLE or like, uh, you know, on a, on a smaller scale, the transition time movement in in Britain, which is spreading uh, across the world, uh, even the C40 initiative in, uh, started in, in New York and London. All of these, uh, and there are many others, all of these uh, uh, initiatives are beginning to look at the environmental and particularly the energy performance of cities. And that's all very good stuff. And it's been argued that policymakers in cities <clears throat> in some way are further advanced with trying to address these issues than national policymakers. So that's all good stuff. But when it comes to enabling cities to act differently, we are not going, haven't gone very far so far. Typically, cities are at the receiving, uh, at the receiving end of national policies. And unless we can cha change national policies for the benefit of regenerating the way cities work in a major way, we are not going to get there. So I think we need a major, major policy push to kind to persuade, first of all, the general public that there's a problem that we have to deal with. Secondly, national governments that they have to give new incentives to their populated areas, their, their human habitats, in new ways. And thirdly, then, of course, uh, we need uh, in international agreements to bring really significant changes about. I hope that we can accelerate this process. I'm not convinced at the moment that we are getting there because the interests of those who run the world, you know, these are not just governance interests, but they're financial interests, and those are currently going very much in the opposite direction. Well, in, indeed. I mean, in order for us to consume less, we would surely have to abandon the capitalist system, which is surely predicated on continued growth and continued increasing consumption. Yeah, there is a major systemic issue in terms of economic and financial systems, uh, which cities are only a part of, of course. I mean, cities are expressions of, that, of those types of ideologies, and so, so currently, uh, you know, they are a reflection of what is happening in terms of economic growth and financial borrowing systems, you know, in ways that currently operate in the world, and, uh, you know, they are still spreading across the world, even in places that are relatively sustainable at this moment in time. So we have a big, big problem on our hands, and I can only hope that, you know, as obviously it is often being said, once we are experiencing uh, things like, you know, major sea level rises or major temperature increases, major uh, uh, atmospheric, uh, uh, you know, problems like hurricanes and so on, as we are beginning to experience that, that will trigger uh, in it, uh, a major response by the international community, but then it will be too late. So we need to learn how to anticipate and predict and act uh, with foresight rather than responding, and that certainly is not something that we are good at at the present time. No, um, but you're doing your bit. Are you, one of the places where you're working now, I believe, is in Bristol, and Bristol is yes. somewhere where there is the, the Bristol Pound, which is an attempt to, yeah. to come up with an alternative economic system where wealth is kept and invested under, I suppose, different rules and, and kept within the, the city boundaries. Do you think yeah. that this is a possible solution for other cities to follow? Well, there are quite a few cities now with their own local currencies. I mean, in, in this country, Totnes as well, and quite a few others on the continent too. So local currencies are certainly beginning to make an impact. 
Uh, but interestingly, in Bristol, there's a lot more ha happening than just the Bristol Pound. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm quite heavily engaged there. Bristol is also uh, in next year, 2015, European Green Capital. And uh, it also has an in independent mayor who was elected two years ago, George Ferguson. And there's really a very interesting constellation, similar to what I experienced in Adelaide uh, 11 years ago, of uh, both large numbers of local people and community groups, NGOs, uh, you know, all under a sort of green uh, sort of paradigm, as well as uh, a mayor who wants to see Bristol at the, fo uh, Bristol at the forefront of uh, a city moving not only towards uh, uh, regenerative development, but also to create an, a new economy from that. So there is a lot of convergence of a whole range of different uh, developments in, in Bristol that I think are very hopeful indeed. And I think we will see next year whether or not it can make a significant difference to transforming that city. Uh, one of the best examples that I know of a city that has transformed itself, apart from the example already mentioned, which was Adelaide, is actually Copenhagen. And I've written that up in my book, uh, Creating Regenerative Cities. Copenhagen has gone, done all the right things in terms of renewable energy, in terms of uh, pedestrianize, uh, pedestrianizing its city center, uh, cycle tracks everywhere, uh, energy efficiency, combined heat and power, uh, and uh, all the ingredients of a regenerative cities are really in place there. It is a really, really remarkable development. So I think uh, we are seeing more developments in terms of retrofitting existing cities and developed countries than currently uh, new ecosystem, eco-city developments or ecopolis developments across the world. But certainly one shouldn't give, enough ho give up hope, certainly as the world's leaders and as the world's people realize that we are on a major collision course with our own future. I think these ideas will come to the fore of hopefully much more rapidly than currently seems to be uh, seems to be the case. Well, I certainly hope you're right, Herbert. Um, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for talking to us. And David, thank you very much for all your brilliant work with the Sustainable Cities Co uh, Cooperative. I think you're doing a really brilliant job and I really love looking at your website and uh, all the uh, discussions that you initiate on, on, on Facebook and uh, on, uh, on LinkedIn and so on. So thank you very, very much for all of that. That's a pleasure. It's doing a, you're doing a great job. Thank you, Herbert. Speak bye bye. to you next time. Bye bye. Thank you.